Ladies and gentlemen, a very pleasant good morning to you. My name is Ramni Subramanian and I have immense pleasure in welcoming you dear students I also wish to welcome on your behalf and on behalf of everybody at Avagma our distinguished guru of this morning, Ms. M. Padma Priya. A warm welcome to you, Ms. Padma Priya. I need to tell you a little bit about our guru of this morning. After securing a BSc Chemistry Honours degree, from Stella Maris at Chennai in 2000, Padma Priya moved on to the Xavier Institute of Management in Bangalore and secured an MBA with a specialization in marketing in 2002. In the last 12 years, she has created a great eminence and distinction for herself in the world of advertising and creative communications. Her 12-year career in advertising has spread over some of the most distinguished advertising companies in the world. Dintra's Low, Mudra Communications, Leo Burnett, and Ogilvy and Mater, better known as o and and even perhaps more better known as the world's largest advertising agency. During these years in advertising, Padma Priya has been mainly concerned with planning and strategic development of brands, which means that she has launched many products which have turned out to be outstanding brands. She has sustained brands over a period of time, ensuring tremendous equity for the brands. Ladies and gentlemen, I requested Ms. Padma Priya to say something on herself which would be of interest to us. And I quote what she told me, and with your permission I'll read it. I love the mountains, and I want to scale the Everest soon. I do a lot of trekking and make an annual trip to the Himalayas. I'm also an avid reader and write children's stories that tickle a lot of children. I read them too. Now you have an idea of the versatility of our guru of this morning. Padma Priya will talk to us today about the exciting world that we are living in. I believe these are remarkable times that we are going through, the likes of which I, for one, haven't seen for many, many years. She's good, therefore, to talk about the changing media landscape and a brand called You. May I request Ms. Padma Priya to take over from here. Thank you, Professor. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, like the Professor said, what I'm going to speak to you about today is um, the changing media landscape. And uh, by which I mean that even if you take some, some time as recent as probably five years ago, most marketers when they sp spoke about an advertising campaign would talk about television, print, some radio, some outdoor, and this was the media plan. Today, that has changed because we all know just as consumers, we spend a considerable amount of time online. and. Uh, the digital medium is a space which is fantastic for a marketer from two perspectives. One, you have the undivided attention of the consumer. 
two, you can actually measure the response, you can measure the kind of engagement that the consumer is having with your piece of communication, which is why increasingly when, uh, when even a very traditional marketer looks at uh, advertising currently, a large amount of time, effort and money is spent behind the digital medium. However, that is not what I'm going to speak to you about today, not just about that. What I'm going to talk about is how the digital medium has actually changed the definition of brands. So it is no longer what um, a third party sitting somewhere far away manufactures and gives you. Today a brand is you and me. I'm a brand, you're a brand because if you do a Google search on your brand, on your name, on your brand name, that's really what you're searching and you'll be amazed at the kind of results that are thrown up. And um, because we are all brands ourselves, it is very important for us to understand what this means and to somewhere start cultivating the brand that we are. So that is essentially what I am going to speak to you about today. Sorry, that was a technical glitch. Okay, so the, uh, the presentation that I have for you and I hear from Professor Ramani that I have about 45 minutes. So I will essentially be talking about um, things in four large sections. The first is the changing landscape, which is essentially what is the power of the new media that we're talking about. Then, like I briefly mentioned earlier, what is, it, what is, what is a brand today? What are the new definitions of branding? And the third point would be who or what is brand you? And the fourth is if you and I are brands, how do we really harness new media to build this brand called you? So, um, so this picture is just for illustrative purposes, but essentially how the world is at your fingertips at the click of a mouse, that's all. Every info, there is nothing called a closed door anymore. They are all open doors. Every information is open to you out there for you to reach out to. I have put a very interesting a case study that is very close to my heart, not because I've worked on this, but because it has really changed the world for all of us. And this brand, as we know it, actually was launched very recently. Launched about four, five years ago. Five years, I think, is the earliest all of us would have heard of it. And this brand, essentially, even to its very core consumers, was a brand that most people had just never heard of. And they had no affinity towards this brand. They had no reason to listen to this brand when they were spoken to about this brand. This brand offered no obvious rational benefits. Actually, to the contrary, this brand promised something that would shake people up. And this brand was poised to launch in a world of intense competition. And this brand, ladies and gentlemen, is Barack Obama. Barack Obama went from a senator who very few people had heard of to become America's favorite poster boy. And a lot of people, while of course he is a man of great values and promised to change the country, most people had not even heard of him. Most people were very uncomfortable with the face of Barack Obama and the presentation, the case study that I'm going to present to you is really about how Barack Obama's dig digital strategy helped him become the president. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is divided into three sections. The first is if you take Barack Obama as a brand, what was the goal of the brand? The second, what was the strategy behind the brand? And the third is what, is, what were the tactics involved in building the brand? What was the goal? Of course, the goal was to become, was to win the elections and become the president of the United States of America and the most powerful man in the world. What was the strategy? If you see, the brand very clearly had a unique selling proposition. That was about change we can believe in. Everything about Barack Obama was change. And if you saw 
his presidential uh, opponent was a continuation of the story that America was used to so far. And what was the media plan? The media plan was whatever Barack Obama did, it was delivered through the internet, making the internet essentially the hub of all operations. The second was to be at grassroots, which is essentially everything that most brands really oh, talk you. about, which is think at the individual consumer's level, meet your consumer, really understand what, understand his world, understand what his and her concerns are, understand what they're talking about. And this Mr. Obama did fantastically. And the third was create and maintain connections, which is not just about, you know, status messages, etc., but how do you essentially make consumers feel part of a larger mission, which is how do you how do you take people along with you when you're on a trajectory? And that again is something Mr. Obama did beautifully. We'll move on to what were the tactics involved. One, and these are, um, one, when one looks at the digital strategy, what I have done is what are the lessons one can draw from Mr. Obama's um, digital strategy? And uh, my submission is that if, and if you think any particular point is pertinent or interesting, in the pers from the perspective of building your own brand, I would like you to note it down and once this session is over, when we have a question and answer session, if any of you have, a cer have certain points of view or want to discuss it, we'd I'll be happy to do that. So the first one, which is actually moving from the world we knew today itself to the slightly older times when, you know, uh, direct selling was really important and this is, this is what most con companies really swore by. And uh, Mr. Obama dipped into this for his first strategy lesson, okay, which is a centralized consumer database is the difference between good and marketing. When we're speaking to millions of voters sitting out there, it is very important to understand not just who is a Republican, who is a Democrat, but also understand who is the most likely to switch, who is most likely, who is most open to change, who is most likely to vote for me, and how do I target that person. So essentially, the Obama campaign team had a database of every voter and reached out to them in a manner that was most compelling. The second lesson that we hear that uh, we have is social networks leverage a very vast audience very quickly and while there are hundreds of social networks out there the campaign decided to focus on the top four which is Facebook LinkedIn MySpace and Flickr and they had specialized programs for each of these so uh, this is some interesting statistics so the, in, on both Facebook and MySpace, Obama had approximately 380% more followers than, than his competition. And this in sheer numbers is mind-boggling. YouTube is a powerful medium to spread your message. And uh, while, it is, while you, know, you would imagine that a, you know, a presidential candidate has a lot of money and can go mainline and can have a lot of television spots, what YouTube does is very, is far more important. The first thing about television is that there is a certain time that your television spot happens on and if a viewer watches it then fantastic, if he doesn't, you've lost you've the lost viewer. You. However, in digital, the advantage is once your message is out there, it stays there. So if a viewer misses your message once, you have umpteen number of opportunities to take back that message to the viewer. The second most important thing about digital is how it enables things to go viral. So if I see a very interesting video about Barack Obama, nothing stops me from sharing it with my friends and from, from them, for them to uh, go and check this out. So if you see this, that if you see the Yes We Can music video was viewed more than 14.2 million times and 15 videos viewed more than 1 million times and these are viewership numbers that television very often does not go really close to. The fourth is no sale is too small in generating relationship with consumers. So if you see the campaign donations that came from online, 
There were a lot of smaller denomination donations, but the cumulative number, it reached to about $500 million were garnered for the Obama campaign from online donations. The fifth, and we are all, all of us get spam emails, and this is something that all of us are very wary of. However, if you target, if you target emails with the right messaging to the right target consumer, then it's a very powerful tool. And this is something that we all do in advertising all the time, which is consumer clustering. Based on behavior, based on attitudes, we cluster consumers into various segments. And this is exactly what the campaign did. The campaign um, clustered consumers into 7,000 different uh, segments and sent targeted emails to them. The other thing which, um, which most marketers don't, don't really think about is search engine marketing. And uh, this is very critical and the targeted banner advertising can draw huge response. And uh, the other lessons are mobile applications can engage users anywhere and anytime. If digital promises that, mobile promises that with a lot of mobility actually. Twitter enables quick notifications to audience. Blogging when done with a lot of authenticity and with an image of expertise is very powerful. And the last lesson is don't give the consumer any reason not to buy. If you have a transaction, if you have a message that is very powerful to your consumer, then please close the loop there and then don't give your consumer any reason to walk away. Um, here we have a video. This video is really the difference which has happened in the last 10 years. This is a video of the Bush campaign. So this is how presidential elections were run before Barack Obama really changed the way the world was run. So the point here is that um, while that kind of messaging, that kind of communication did work, its time is over now and the way one communicates even as a consumer has changed today. So we've all heard of this that we moved from a one-way communication, not even a two-way communication anymore but to a multi-way, multi-dimensional, multi-way communication. And if that is the change, if that is a changed world that we are living in, how do we really market ourselves? Now let's talk about brands. So what are brands? And why is branding important? And what does branding mean for you and me? So what is a brand? A brand is, of course, the brand name. There is a brand logo which is a visual short handle that we give the consumer for the brand and there is a world of associations that is there with the brand and which is why each brand is very unique. So while the name and logo may be common, the associations that the brand have in every consumer's mind is very different. Of course, it, it stems from a common world, it stems from the semiotics that one puts out as a marketer. but the associations in each consumer's mind is very unique and therefore every brand is almost very unique. What does a brand have to do? 
a brand of any good brand, if you think of your favorite brands or even brands that you don't really like, they arouse emotion. So you may love the brand, you may hate the brand, but all of that is emotion that the brand arouses in you. It ignites passion. So you passionately defend the brand that you love or passionately trash the brand that you hate. It echoes reliability. So somewhere, if I'm a brand, the quality of the product that I put out is a given. And the brand has meaning. So in the words of Richard Branson, a brand is more than a name or a logo. It is a promise and a contract with every customer with whom you're dealing. And if people feel that the offering does not live up to what they expect from the brand, they will decide to stop buying. And therefore, it is, it is not just a very rational um, contract that you have with the customer, but it also is the emotional contract. So when you buy a luxury product, so let's say one goes out shopping and buys a luxury car or a luxury bag, then I'm not just buying into fine craftsmanship, I'm buying into pride of ownership. I'm buying into brag values and if tomorrow something takes away from the brag value of owning a Louis Vuitton bag, then I'm just going to feel very cheated by that brand and I will decide to stop investing in that brand in the future. And this increasingly is not just for luxury brands, those, those really epitomize these relationships, but these are about most brands that we talk about today. So if we look at what brands talk about, Apple opposes, IBM solves, Nike exhorts, Virgin enlightens, Sony dreams, penitent protests. Brands are not nouns, but verbs. And if you think about your favorite brands and what they do to you, and it will be interesting if all of you can take about a minute and do this exercise. Most brands that have any meaning in your life actually are verbs. So would you like to take a minute and do this exercise? And if you would like to share with everybody what you think, then I would request you to type in the chat window what your brand really does for you. Okay. Sure. Okay. So um, I have a small clarification now. Some of the examples we've got are: we Photoshop a photo, we connect Nokia connects people. Colgate means uh, Colgate makes your teeth strong. Bata means trust and quality. The, what I'm talking about is take your most favorite brand and think about what it does to your life. So um, I am I'm a Nokia user, so and Nokia is one of my most favorite brands because uh, it it works for me. And in my mind, Nokia simplifies my life. And that is not about connecting people. Nokia's message out to the world is Nokia connects people. But to me, it simplifies my life. And uh, so that is really, yeah. So Apple makes life easy and sophisticated. So that's an interesting one from Ashwin. So if, um, if that is, that's really what I'm, uh, I'm asking you to do, is think of your favorite brand and think about what that brand does to you. So we'll move on, but this is an interesting exercise for you to start thinking, and this will, why I'm asking you to do this, will make sense as we move on when I talk about brand you. So Maggie helps me during midnight hunger. Sure. Okay, so we'll move on now. Now, so we've talked about product brands now. However, there is a vertical expansion of the concept of a brand, and by that, what do I mean? A brand is not just a product, a country is a brand. There is incredible India, and when we speak to people, when we speak to tourists who come to India, the imagery that they have of the country is 
the brand's footprints and that is really uh, tying in with the communication that India as a country is putting out. When we talk about Brazil as a country, or Venezuela as a country, or Italy as a country, any country that you talk about is essentially a brand because the brand has a name, of course the country has a name. The brand has a logo which is essentially the flag of the country and the brand has associations. These may be associations that the country is putting out in the form of advertising, the form of communication or it may just be associations that you have heard from your friends. So when one of your friends visits South America and sees a football match and comes and talks about it to you, those are associations that are forming in your mind about the country. So a country is a brand and increasingly an individual is a brand. Of course, we've all, we all know celebrities as brands. So there's Oprah who is her own brand, there's Nelson Mandela, there's Bono. They're all big, large brands in their own rights. And Lance Armstrong, and uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, when, he, when Lance Armstrong came out, there was a huge furor. And the furor really happened because he was a very strong brand. If this was an individual who came out, people would not have been so outraged. But people bought into the symbolism of brand Lance Armstrong, symbolism of grit, symbolism of perseverance, symbolism of fighting for what you believe in. And when that was taken away from them, when the brand lost, when a very strong brand loses its meaning, it creates a lot of discontent in the mind of its consumers. And like I was saying earlier, you and I, we are all brands. And today, thanks to the internet, we are all brands that have multiple consumers. We can reach out to a larger number of people than ever in the history of mankind. So this is an interesting quote that I found. We must look upon our ourselves as a company with our own intellectual balance sheet and brand name. We need to invest in ourselves and market ourselves. And increasingly, this is becoming very important in the face of competition. So if, um, if one is competing with uh, equally qualified people, then it is really the difference lies in how you market yourself. And this is becoming very important today. So what is brand new? Now, this is where uh, the exercise we did earlier will come to use. So these are a few questions and uh, I don't have much to talk about in this section, but essentially the questions are about what does your brand reflect? So what are your values? What do you want your brand to reflect? So if, is there any divergence from what you are and what you want to be and this is very important. These are questions that we ask about brands, any, any ordinary brand that we want to market. And what are you doing to enhance your brand? So answer these three questions and you will form the basis of your brand map for the future. So I have a question from Ashwin which says, uh, if we are brands, what exactly do we sell as individuals? Now this is a very interesting question. Now if, if I'm a brand, uh, it depends on the consumer I'm selling to. On Facebook to friends, I'm selling my values, I'm selling the fact that I'm a very interesting person, that I have a very interesting life and if you think about it, this is exactly what we're all selling on Facebook. If you're a brand and you're in the job market, you're selling your ability as a professional. Um, yeah, you, uh, Shrisha Kuravi has to say that you sell your personality. Um, you sell your service. Of course, this is exactly what we're all selling. You sell qualities. That is what your brand really stands for. And that is why it's very, very, very important for us to really understand that if I'm a brand, what do I stand for as a brand? What do I want to stand for as a brand? And if there is any difference between one and two, what am I doing to enhance myself? So that is so that is really where that is coming from. So um, would you all like to do this exercise which is answer these three questions and um, then we can move on. Essentially today according to you what does your brand reflect? In the future 
if you are your brand manager, what do you want your brand to reflect? And three, what are you doing to enhance your brand? Aditya, why do I want to stand as a brand? Okay, it is, um, I don't think we have a choice. Today, I think we are all brands. If you are on Facebook and um, you're competing with um, 200, 200 other friends for your friend's attention, then you are a brand who is putting out a message which has to be interesting and engaging. Does that answer your question? I hope it does. How to enhance brand without creating rivalry among co-workers? Now, um, so this is where um, how interesting and engaging your messaging is really comes in. Now, I'll go back to Facebook. Very often, we find certain messages slightly politically incorrect, slightly, uh, some messages cause few, cause furor, and th these are things that your brand may not really want to want to do, but there are brands like Benetton, every ad that Benetton puts out needs to create some controversy. So if you as a brand believe in doing that, there is nothing stopping you from doing that. Yeah, from, uh, CVS Money has a very interesting point. He says to stand out among the crowd, you need to be distinctive. And this is really the genesis of branding itself because when products were being manufactured, how do you distinguish one product from another? How do you create distinction? And that is really where branding as a concept started. And increasingly, this is applying to our social interactions and to us as human beings. So, um, should I move on? Okay. Now, if we are all brands, how do we harness digital media to build your own brand? And again, here we have a few points. The first is stay single-minded, which is you may want to be 10 different things, but Decide what the most important thing is and put out messaging uh, from that perspective. Sorry, this is an interesting question that I will stop this to answer. What is the difference between a product and a brand? Says Vikash, Vikash Singh Vesh to everyone. Okay. Now, Vikash, a prod, product is, is a slipper, is a product. A shoe is a product. But a brand, a barter, a Nike is a brand. When you're buying into a Nike, you're not just buying into a shoe. You're buying into a promise. Nike's promise is that every human being who has hands and feet is an athlete. That is Nike's promise. So Nike stands for all values of sportsmanship, which is courage, which is grit, which is determination, which is fight till you till the last pro. So Nike stands for all of that and that is what you're buying into when you're buying a Nike. You're not just buying any old pair of shoes. So that is really the difference between a product and a brand. Okay, so um, so the first point is stay very single-minded. Decide what is the most important thing for you and put out messaging from that perspective. Now, this is a very personal uh, tip. Don't overlook the benefit of doing both a resume and a CV as part of your branding program. Review them quarterly and grade yourself on growth. And this is very, very, very important because, you know, in the daily grind of doing, of working that we all do, we may very often lose the larger picture and then when you have a quarterly deadline and you quarterly do a review saying that three months ago this is where I was, these are my areas of improvement, this is what I have done to work upon it in the last three months and this is where I am today. It's very, very, very important to do. Um, never say no to any connection, their address book will be useful. And um, this, is, uh, this is something that we all see. You know, we are inundated by friend requests on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc., etc. And sometimes you are you are tempted to say no to a certain connection. But you just never know who will open doors where. So please never say no to any connection. 
if you have blocks, update your block periodically. And this has two advantages. One, it helps in point two, which is when you go back to the back pages of your blog, it will help, it, it is a yardstick measurement of the progress that you have made as an individual. So that is very important. The second is, when you are meeting someone, let's say you're going for an interview and there, you know, you mention that you have a blog. It is nice for the person who's checking your blog to say that your last entry is one week old and not six months old. So everybody knows that you are serious about um, your blog and your points of view. And the last one is be sure to understand your area of specialty words and catchphrases. These need to be embedded into your meta metadata as much as possible. So let's say um, I work in advertising, I work as a strategist and uh, so if I have a blog, the, the important things to the keywords that one would search for are um, maybe strategy, branding. So if I understand the core area that I want to operate in, then I have to embed these key phrases and catchwords in as many places as possible so that when one is searching, my results are thrown up. And this is very important in the face of increased competition. Okay, now here is a question uh, which says, what is the difference between a resume and a CV? Now, um, it's, it's, uh, it's in the form and the matter. Now, a CV is essentially, it lists down what you have done, what your career highlights are, so on and so forth. A resume, however, is far more detailed out in terms of what, what it's almost like when you when you apply to universities abroad and you have to give in a letter stating what is my objective to uh, apply to this program, who am I as an individual, what is my value system. So when one reads your resume, one really understands you as a as a person and where you're coming from, whereas a CV is just a very professional. Um, document. So it really talks about, uh, a CV talks about um, what your career background is, what your achievements have been in your last four jobs, so on and so forth. But a resume is far more detailed in drawing out who you are as a person, in drawing out why you're doing what you're doing, what your interests are, what your value system is, where do you come from. So that is really a difference between a resume and a CV. And if I may say this, uh, one can go as far as saying that a CV can be drawn from a resume. So if you really do a pressy writing of your resume and add your career background, etc., it becomes your CV. So that is really the difference between a resume and a CV. So, um, so this really brings me to the end of my talk. And this is my submission to all of you, which is renew your passion, refresh your skills, reinvent your purpose, and reimagine your world. So this brings me to the end of my talk. I will be glad to take um, any questions that you have, any points that you want to discuss in greater detail, we can. Okay, uh, Sharon has this question, which is, do we run uh, the risk with our product of overbranding? The customer may expect always high and be unsatisfied. Now, Sharon, um, let's discuss a few things. Now, who are our customers? And what do we want them to take out of any engagement interaction that they have with us? Now, let's say in in the world of social media, my customers are my friends, right? And what is the message that I want to give out to them? The message that I want to give out to them is that, um, let's say I'm a very politically conscious person. Let's say that is the message that I want to give out to my customers. Now, yes, we do stand the risk of overbranding. And we all know that we have a few friends on Facebook who are constantly putting up pictures, constantly um, boring us with the greater mundane details of their lives. But, um, but that said and done, uh, in the world of increased competition and in a world where your, the probability of your messaging getting lost, I'd rather err on the side of caution 
and do a bit of overbranding. An example of a very good brand and doesn't sell well because marketing not so good. Actually, it depends. Now, let's say that Bata is a very fantastic brand amongst its certain set of people. And the, the values of Bata, which is quality, which is value for money, which is certain uh, design expertise, etc., they are, um, they are valuable to a certain set of consumers that buy from Bata. So to those consumers, Bata is a very good brand. But for a larger set of, but for someone who buys from Nike, they will rubbish Bata's marketing and they will say, this is just not a brand for me. So I can't think of one example of a brand which is very good but doesn't sell well because its marketing is not good. Because at the end of the day, the job of marketing is to build a good brand and if marketing has done that then that question is does not hold true. Now isn't customer satisfaction the best way to a brand? Now um, there are brands and these are very small niche brands that, um, that, <laughs> behave, is very, that behave very counterintuitively. Now, um, for example, there is a brand called Grey Popon. It's a brand of mustard and it's a very premium brand from the United States. Now, if one were to check that brand out on Facebook, if let's say you, give, you send a friend request to that brand, the brand does not accept your friend request. The brand says that we will go through your profile and see if you are fit enough to become the brand's friend. So the brand has redefined customer satisfaction from a perspective saying that it is not about I will not chase the customer and satisfy him, let the customer chase me and it's almost, so it's, it, that's the pleasure that the customer gets. Uh, um, so Jitendra Varma has a question, earlier very few people do branding to themselves, now many agencies are ready to give you such service. How to evaluate? Now, um, so unless one is Barack Obama, there are very few agencies that do, that build personal brands at the level that you and I would be interested in. So then it is up to how you and I would build our brands. That said, if one were to evaluate how an agency would build your brand, then the important things to note are whether the agency has really understood where you are and where you want to be, which is what does the journey entail? And secondly, what is your strategy and tactics for going through the journey? So that is essentially what one would look for. Uh, okay, so Shawan has another question. How much closely in real life marketing people know their product except company, vision, etc.? Now, um, as a marketing professional, um, our endeavor, my endeavor has always been to really understand the product that one is putting out for the customer to buy. You may like the product, you may not like the product because that is not what you as a customer would buy. But it's very important, if you are going to sell to someone, then it's very important to understand what you are selling. And most often than not, marketing people do understand the product that they are putting out to be sold. Arindam Rakshita has a question. Would you mean a brand is... Uh, good which sells more in the market. Now this depends, Arindam, the, the answer to this is what the brand's objective is. Now there are certain brands uh, which are not brand, which are not category leaders or market leaders but they're leaders in mind share measures. So um, Louis Vuitton is an example. Now amongst luxury 
um, amongst people who know about luxury brands, that brand is a very top of mind brand and the brand is very rich in terms of the associations that one has towards this brand. That said and done, if you compare the sales of Louis Vuitton to a Samsonite, a Samsonite will have much larger sales. So it it's not always just measured by sales and market, which is a very important matrix nonetheless, but it also is measured in mind share. And most brand managers, when you see, um, they look at two matrices. One is, of course, sales, but the second is, what is the brand health? What is the brand perception? What do people think of the brand? What is the awareness level? So that is really what indicates whether the brand is good, is doing well, etc. Just like a pro uh, Prem Chandra has an interesting question. Just like a product has a lifespan, product has a lifespan, does a brand also have such lifespan? Any examples? Absolutely. Now, um, because brands are in product categories, unless a brand reinvents itself, the brand will also have a life cycle. Let's take the example of Bajaj. Um, Till before liberalization, Bajaj was synonymous with the world of scooters. Now, suddenly after liberalization, the consumer need changed. So from the world of scooters, we went to the world of bikes. And what Bajaj did very interestingly is that the brand did not leave behind. The brand was definitely threatened by becoming, you know, threatened with irrelevance because the consumer had moved on from the product category. However, what the brand did is they um, they managed to move their expertise from scooters to automobiles saying that I am a fantastic automobile manufacturer, so the brand did not become irrelevant. However, the brand was in, uh, when, when the consumers moved from uh, scooters to bikes, the brand was threatened with irrelevance. Okay. Now HMT, Alak Pal, HMT is a fantastic example of a brand that did not do that transition. When the consumers moved, the brand did not change at all and which is why most people don't even think of that brand anymore. Alpesh Parikh, there are certain brands whose advertising and other stuffs are good but fails in the mind of consumers. What are the reasons? Will you give me an example of a brand um, in your mind which had fantastic advertising and marketing but failed in the mind of consumers? then it will help me see, understand where you're coming from. Okay, Virendra Kashyap, as marketing people nowadays, it's very difficult to establish a new brand because competition is very healthy. Okay, now, which is why um, what brands do today is no longer talk about one-way communication. Um, they really do very compelling communication on, in the digital media which really engage the consumer and enter the world of consumer. So the way brands were built in the past are very different from the way brands are currently being built. And even our definition of a brand's success has changed. So earlier, if a brand was launched, Within two years, if you had 20% of the market share, you were considered a roaring success. Today, we all know that that is not possible, given the face of increased competition. So, um, what the brand, what brands do today is to say, I will, I will track mind measures. I will track the number of fans I have. I will track the number of people who engage with me. So today it's far more slow burn as a strategy than it used to be earlier. I hope that answers your question.
Alpesh Parikh, top ramen. Actually, they are competing with Maggie. It's uh, this is very uh, this is very interesting that you talk about. I think this is in reference to the earlier question, which was about brands doing good marketing, etc., but are not being able to sell. Now, I work on uh, one of the competitors for Maggie, and uh, therefore, it's very interesting to really see what Top Ramen did. Now, uh, if you look at how Maggie was built as a brand, Maggie was launched in the 1970s as a convenience snack for kids. Now, um, and that is really why the category entered the home. If you see how Top Ramen was built initially, it was meant as a noodle for adults and that just did not fly in the consumer's face because I am alright with Maggie as a brand even for adults. I don't need a specialized brand for adults because I don't have any specialized taste preferences. So that was one. The second, the, uh, late, lately what uh, Top Ramen has done has also not flown in the consumer's mind because there is no reason that Top Ramen is giving them to re-evaluate Maggie. You're not giving me a different taste, you're not giving me a different form factor, you're not giving me anything different. You're, you gave me a different base in the form of oats but that was not even tasty. So you, so as a brand Top Ramen is not giving anybody <coughs> any reason to reevaluate Maggie and that is probably why they are not doing well. So from that perspective I don't think Top Ramen's marketing is good at all. Okay, um, I think we'll have to close in the next five minutes. So I will take the last few questions now. Sunil Mahajan has an interesting question. Can we say success of a brand is equal to popularity or profitability? And um, Sunil, in my mind, both are really linked because um, if a brand is popular, then more and more people buy it and therefore your profitability goes up. And therefore, in my mind, they are both linked. Rishi Raj, what should brands do to target and successfully build and sustain CXO or HNI customers? Um, I will not be answer, able to answer this in great detail now, but if you look at brands like IBM and if you do a Google check, it will throw up a lot of case studies on how brands like IBM, Cisco, etc. do a lot of um, targeting CXOs. For HNIs, you may want to look at banks. You may want to look at how luxury brands are built. They all have very interesting uh, points of view and case studies on how they ta very successfully target CXOs and HNIs. CVS money, all attributes of a product being the same, there has to be a USP to retain customer attention, isn't it? Absolutely. And uh, increasingly we live in a world where mostly products are on parity and what we are buying into our brands and then of course we would need a USP to get customer attention. Does branding need to be updated from time to time in tune with the current scenario? This is a question from Adi and this is a very, very important thing for brands to do. If, um, and one case study, if any of you are interested in reading up, would be Pepsi. Pepsi has always stood for the voice of the youth, but it's very interesting to see how they keep updating their communication to reflect the values of the current generation of youth. So. In the 80s, if it was about irreverence, if it was about questioning status quo, Pepsi took on Coke. Today's youth are not about that and their communication talks about the values that today's youth hold very close to heart. So that is how they continuously update their communication. Alpesh Parekh, Limka 
does not do as well compared to Pepsi and Coke and this uh, this in my mind also has to do with categories. Um, I've worked very briefly on the carbonate soft, carbonated soft drinks category and as a category the, the Limca which is called the clouded soft drinks category is not doing well. That is a category that the consumer is growing out of. So clear drinks is a category which is like Sprite 7up are growing fast even your dark colas, Coke and Pepsi are not doing too well. So Limcas not doing too well may not have to do with the brand as much as to do with the category. Is branding a guerrilla marketing strategy from Falgun? Falgun that depends on brands. Certain brands may flank, certain brands may have a guerrilla marketing strategy, certain brands may have a leadership stance. So it really depends on where the brand is with respect to the category. From Bhargav, how many percentage of population use brands? Um, in my mind, close to 100% of the population use brands. They may not be brands that you or I would use, but they are brands that that people of that strata use. So I think brand usage is almost universal. A uh, question from Shaun, do you feel branding will saturate in a few more years and customer satisfaction of word of mouth will spread digitally and have more weightage? Absolutely, we are seeing that even today. But the, but the interesting thing is that is why the definition of branding has changed. So branding is no longer just about a television or a radio commercial or a print ad or an outdoor hoarding that you see, but brands really engage consumers and drive word of mouth. So. Today a brand manager's job is as much to drive word of mouth and digital engagement as it is to spread, as it is to develop a television commercial. Okay, uh, this is the last question I'm going to answer. Um, this is a question from Shushant Kumar Mishra. What should the marketing strategy be for a Me Too brand in a competitive market when I don't have anything unique to offer? And I don't think you have much hope if that's really the scenario because um, there is only so much perceived difference or so much emotional difference that you can create, especially in a low involvement category if that is the category one would talk about then uh, you will definitely need to have at least a very superficial if for the lack of anything better even at least a superficial differentiation if you're an absolute me to me to brand then there is no hope in hell so thank you so much for having me over it's been a pleasure Padma Priya, thank you so much for a very impressive presentation. Uh, I have the singular honor of summing up, but after listening to Padma Priya and the enormous amount of interest she has generated, uh, amply demonstrated by the huge number of questions and a very, very enlightened audience uh, which has attended today's session in very large numbers. I'm not going to sum up, but I'm going to very briefly enumerate the takeaways that a brand called Padma Priya has impacted on me. From very deftly introducing the subject through Barack Obama, and his fantastic conception of change we can believe in. Padma Priya very deftly took us through some key questions. She has asked us to examine what is our current valuation of ourselves. 
and she has also advised us to keep updating this valuation by periodic re-evaluation. I think that's very good advice both for people like me as a faculty and for people like you who are working but are also students. And I think these are the three specific takeaways that I shall remember for a long, long time from this wonderful session we had from Padma Priya today. Padma Priya, I want to thank you immensely for accepting our invitation and being with us despite your numerous engagements. I telephoned her just before she arrived at our office to find out if she needs any help on the directions. She said, no, I've just come into Bangalore. I will be not there at 9.30. I hope you don't mind if I come at 9.40. Now, that, that's something that impressed me a great deal. So on your behalf, dear students, and on behalf of our AVEGMA, I'd like to thank you, Padma Priya, for being with us, and I hope you will come again. Goodbye to all of you, and God bless you all.